This is All Out Politics, news debate and opinion uh, from the heart of Westminster. Conversations around Brexit are becoming more complex than ever before. Let's just remind you exactly what is meant by the backstop and the differences between a Canada or Norway style deal. The withdrawal agreement is the Prime Minister's agreed deal with the European Union on the terms of the UK's departure. It covers how much money the United Kingdom should pay the EU as a settlement, the transition period, citizens' rights and the so-called backstop. The backstop is how Mrs May plans to avoid a hard border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland uh, when the UK leaves the EU. The proposal is for the EU and the whole of the UK to enter a temporary single customs territory until a permanent solution can be found. But Northern Ireland would also have to follow some other EU rules. No deal means the UK will leave the EU with no agreements in place for what the relationship would look like in the future. The UK would become a third country to the European Union and commerce would be governed by World Trade Organization rules. Each member of the World Trade Organization has a list of taxes on imports and limits on the number of goods that they apply to other countries. As part of the EU, the UK trades with countries such as the US, Brazil, China and Australia on these terms. However, most big economies also have a series of bilateral agreements with the European Union as well as WTO rules. A Norway-style deal would mean that the United Kingdom becomes a member of the European Economic Area, or EEA, and EFTA, the European Free Trade Association, which Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein and Switzerland belong to. It would mean full access to the single market and very limited barriers to trade with the European Union. But Norway does contribute to the EU budget and abides by many of the EU's rules. Canada's free trade deal with the EU is called the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, or CETA, and it means that most imported goods aren't taxed, but there are some additional customs checks. Canada doesn't pay into the EU's budget, but there is no free movement and there is no free movement of people. Some people in favour of leaving the EU would like the benefits of the Canada deal plus greater access to the EU and its financial institutions and fewer restrictions on things like food production to avoid the need for border checks. Okay, uh, so uh, those are the options uh, 100 years on. What, uh, and uh, let's discuss them now uh, with uh, Stephen Kinnock, uh, the Labour MP, uh, Ben Bradshaw, Labour MP, and uh, Gillian Keegan, Conservative MP, all with different ideas. I uh, hope we're not going to argue about those definitions. More or less right? Yep. Yeah, pretty pretty right. Good. Okay, pretty good. good. Pretty good. But you've got a different idea, Gillian Keegan. What would you like to do? Um, well, I think I'm back in still the Prime Minister's deal. Um, what, what the Prime Minister's deal is, it's a bespoke arrangement, effectively. So it's kind of got, it's trying to achieve the same as both Norway, as Norway is trying to, which is basically to have frictionless trade. But it does it in a way which is bespoke to us. So one of the things that we try to respect from the referendum result is ending free movement, which wouldn't be in Norway. So I believe, personally, that the Prime Minister's deal is a bit more ambitious than Norway. Uh, but of course, I do understand that uh, it is a political declaration that we have to turn into an agreement. But I feel quite comfortable that we have a, a good negotiating position. Uh, and this direction. document, whose document is this? Well, I've looked at them all over the weekend uh, again. So this one is the better deal, better future. This is the uh, one that um, I guess the, um, the Brexiteers are supporting. And then I've also got some notes on Common Market yeah. 2.0, which is, yeah. I think, uh, Stephen's yeah, got we'll over there. So are you supporting the Brexiteers version? No, I'm not. No, it's, ha um, it's basically, uh, it doesn't actually give any answers to what should happen on the border. Um, that's still... Uh, remains to be uh, and actually it's still a deal it's still a deal that needs to be done and one of the things about all of these agreements is if there is something that needs to be negotiated after you know march if there is something that we basically say we're going to put this on the back burner until you know between march and december anything needs a backstop so no matter what the thing that is um causing the prime minister's deal most trouble is the backstop that will have to be fixed in almost all of the scenarios okay. What's your proposal? You've so, another document. Now. Here's one I prepared earlier. It's a bit like being on Blue Peter, Adam. Um, uh, Common Market 2.0, in effect, is what's called the, often called the Norway Plus Option. It means uh, going into the European Economic Area via the EFTA pillar. But it is a 21st century version of that because 
Uh, we know that there are safeguard clauses in the EEA agreement on free movement of labour. Uh, we know that it also would deal with the backstop because uh, once we've got full uh, single market access through the EEA, plus a form of customs union, right. that's the plus bit of Norway plus, you deal with the Northern and Irish let's border be clear, as single market, a single market access, how much does it cost us? Uh, and also it does mean freedom of movement, doesn't it? Well, on the cost, if we assume that we use the same per capita um, methodology that is used for Norway, it's about 50% of what Norway pays per capita. On free movement of labour, I accept that we couldn't use those safeguard clauses uh, with lightly, but Articles 112 and 113 of the EEA agreement are absolutely clear. They're there in black and white. You have an emergency break and the ability under 113 to uh, renegotiate uh, on a long-term basis basis how free movement of labour works. Using them is a decision of sovereign, the sovereign British Parliament and sovereign government, but that is of course uh, a big difference to what we have if we were fully members of the European Union, no, where ben, there's no, no controls ben at all. Ben Bradshaw, could you, you could buy that, couldn't you? I, I completely agree with Stephen that a Norway-style deal is the least damaging Brexit and it also helps resolve the Irish border question. I'm sceptical as to whether a, it can get through Parliament, and B, whether the European Union would allow a lengthy extension of Article 50 for an uncertain uh, destination uh, point. But let's put it to the test. Let's put these options to the test in Parliament. But I think that even in the end, if we get Norway or something like it, whatever it is, it's going to be very different from the deal that was sold to the British public in, 20, in 2016. So I think there's a very strong principle case for saying if it's Norway, if it's Theresa May's deal, if it's whatever else, that the people should be given the final say on this. But isn't there a problem that if that's what Parliament Parliament agrees, people will say stitch up and, exactly. uh, and they'll just kick you in the teeth exactly. in the referendum. I think, I think one of the problems with, I mean I voted for Norway last May and I've been arguing ever since the referendum with the Prime Minister, she needs to compromise, she needs to do the least damaging Brexit. However, I think you're absolutely right, at this stage, if somehow Parliament agreed for a Norway type thing or a softer alternative to Theresa May's deal, a lot of people out there who voted leave and remain wouldn't be happy and they'd say this is a politician and stitch they'd up. they'd vote it down in a referendum. So well they might know. vote it down in a referendum, but let's give them the chance to do that, let's give them the chance to express their opinion. Anything wrong? With Norway, from your point of view? The freedom of movement break basically means that you have to have um, severe, serious uh, society, economic or environmental concerns and then you can apply the break. I don't think we have ever met those conditions and I don't think a country our size would ever meet those conditions. So that's why I think just clear ending of free movement, which is, I think, probably the number one requirement of those who So you couldn't go into the single market even though it was Mrs Thatcher's idea, as it were? I mean, Mrs Thatcher's idea when it was the idea is now the referendum has come up with, a, with, a, with an alternative answer. I mean, that's, that's, the, dis that's the difficulty we're all, you know, we're, all, we're all wrestling with. So the reason I prefer the Prime Minister's deal is it's much clearer on freedom of movement. And I believe we do need to have our own immigration policy. I think it's going to be, as, as Ben said, it is hard to sell back to the the British people because who knows which part of the messages they took on board before they voted but I think personally of all the people I've spoken to the one number one objective would be to at least have a control over our own immigration policy. So your plan is just not firm enough? Well, the problem with the Prime Minister's deal is it's dead in the water. It's just been crushed Only in Parliament it. by 230. <laughs> well, but, but thanks for accepting that it's dead. So <laughs> no, it, I, but I think it's it an academic discussion. The Prime, we are now down to, I think, three options. Uh, leave with no deal at all. Catastrophe for the British economy. A second referendum. I have deep reservations about that because I think that it, it would just be dividing well, a sort of deeply the divided country. Be, yeah, or, or, or the Common Market 2.0 option. I, I think it's time for Parliament to read discover the lost art of compromise and I also think that uh, with this it is a, an amendment to the political declaration it's the only thing that's got a chance of getting through with either before the 29th of March or possibly with a but, very but, I mean, small extension but you do have a problem 50. with that which is that not only did a majority 70.4 million vote to leave but we've now got opinion polls showing that 28 percent are quite happy to leave without a deal I, that's what's terrifying about the second referendum. I personally can't support a ballot paper in a second referendum which has no deal on it because I know that would finish the steelworks in my constituency. And we cannot play so Russian So you, you, are, you are happy to say, I as a parliamentarian 
and willing to defy the will of the people as expressed in, in, in the referendum. I've always felt that 5248 was a mandate to move house but stay in the same neighbourhood. You can try to do a microanalysis of all 17.4 million re people and why they voted. It's impossible, but you can take it as an aggregate. 5248 is a mandate for a soft Brexit. It always has been, and that's why there's always been a parliamentary majority for it. To be fair to Stephen Adam, Norway is still leaving. I mean, it is outside is the Brexit, European yeah. Union, but for that well, very reason... Not to well, Mark Francois which, or Bernard Jenkins Which is exactly, why, or which is exactly well, why I think <laughs> that in the so end, I don't agree lines. with Stephen, uh, that to put this proposition or any other proposition back to the people if Parliament can't agree is somehow, we're divided already as a yeah. country and the, if we're going to be dragged out, if the people who voted leave or remain are going to be dragged out on a deal which most of them don't like, that's really going to cause lots so of public what anger would, and So what would your division. question be? You know, I think that would be for Parliament to decide. I don't have a firm view on that at the moment. Certainly Remain would have to be on because that's the best deal. The best deal is the one we have at the moment. That would have to be on the ballot paper. So wouldn't it just be a rerun, Remain or, or Leave? Not no necessarily. Deal? You could ha I think you might have to have something that would appease the hard Brexiteers on there as well. But that would be for Parliament ultimately to decide democratically. Well, I'm not in favour of a second referendum at all. I think it's very disrespectful to the people who voted in the first referendum to leave. I didn't, but I know many people who did, and they would feel very insulted by that. And actually, I think it's an abdication of our duty. If we can't get in a room, a big room, and sort out a deal to leave the European Union in the best interest of our country, then there's something wrong with us. Because I believe the more you look at but no that's deal... that's the point, isn't it? I mean, uh, it you, is, but we've still got... Years and, and there must be something wrong with you. It always happens at the last, in the last um, weeks, and we are in the last, well, months at the well. moment. So that is not unusual, because people have to move the art of the compromise, as Stephen okay. says. But the more you look at no deal, the closer you get to really understand it and I'm not saying all 28% didn't look at the great detail but they may not have the more you understand it the more you think that is really not a good option yeah. well, on that we can all agree <laughs> and now Stephen you've worked in Brussels mm. what do you say to this and we do hear it often we heard it yesterday from Liam Fox saying aha Brussels always does things at the last minute they always give way they always make concessions at, at the last minute. I mean having been at quite a lot of all-night sessions at the, uh, the European Council, I mean, there is an element of truth in that, isn't there? Yeah, but when it comes to trade negotiations, they are as hard as nails, and they always have been. And what we're seeing here is a well-established process that the, the European Union has negotiated dozens and dozens of trade deals, and they will not relent on protecting their own interests. They will not relent on protecting the integrity of the single market. That is a simple reality that has always been the case. But aren't their own interests flexible trade with the UK? Sure, but uh, in the end, they know that we will suffer far more from a no-deal Brexit than they will and that's why it's always been an asymmetric uh, relationship and, and that, that's why I think we also I actually agree absolutely with uh, Gillian's view that um, you know it's up to us as parliamentarians now to step up to the plate and make this happen but I have to say if the uh, those campaigning for a second referendum were able to define very clearly what the question on the ballot paper would be it would make it much easier to have a discussion about whether or not it's a viable option but as things stand there isn't really a clear plan in place and I think we are so close to the why now it's too risky to vote for something or support something which doesn't have that clarity. What do you think the chances of a last minute breakthrough are? Uh, very, uh, very slim. This is not like a normal negotiation, Adam. This is a choice that we've made as a country, and we still have to decide what sort of Brexit uh, we want. And that's why the Euro I mean, this like, latest thing from the Prime Minister is that the, the bilateral talks with the Irish government are going to resolve the that's Irish. Ridiculous. It's for the birds. It's I mean, ridiculous. it's delusional, and that's the problem. You know, she's still sticking to her red lines. No sign of compromise. We've got to find a way forward for the sake of the country. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, this is all about politics. Coming up next.